Welcome to the Solo Mo Show, a weekly podcast hosted by Corey O'Brien, the social media strategist at Heat and author of The Future of Ads. And I'm Adam Helway, CEO of digital marketing agency Secret Sushi Creative. Each episode, we discuss the intersection of social, local, and mobile. Our goal is to help you understand these topics so you can integrate them into your marketing and advertising. Today is January 24th, 2012, and this is episode number three. Episode number three, Corey. We've made it three in a row, three weeks in a row. Woo! Virtual high five. We're not in the same room at the moment, but uh, virtual high five over there. Virtual high fives deserved all around. Yes, yes. Uh, And uh, how's it going over there? It's going well. Uh, Rain finally cleared up and things are looking good. Yes, yes. Um, We are, as you said, uh, the third week here of January. uh, And we've been kind of tweaking the show a little bit here and there. We've been having some great discussions on um, how to kind of make sure we clarify things on the intro side and messing with the format a little bit and all that. And so far, actually, we, we still haven't officially released the uh, the show. And of course, if somebody hears this, then we will have released the show. But we are uh, kind of working behind the scenes to improve things little by little uh, each episode. Yeah, I was going to say our longtime listeners may notice a new intro, but that would be false. We don't have any longtime listeners yet. So <laughs> a long time would be two weeks, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we look forward to getting some feedback from folks once we get this sucker up. And the rest of the episodes, uh, and we'll continue to press forward and improve and uh, and create new episodes on a weekly basis. Um, excuse me if I do any sort of clearing of the throat to where I sound a little bit like a frog on any particular words because uh, I came down with something over the last couple of days. Um, and as you so poignantly pointed out, you have me recorded separately. So that way, if there's anything I say that you don't like, you can cut it completely out of the podcast. <laughs> There you go. Your last uh, your last two minutes is coming out, so we'll just record that over again. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Um, so you know, I'm interested to know. You, I think it was last week, right? Or was it the 16th? I think. Um, you correct me if I'm wrong. They had the the SOPA blackouts all over the interwebs. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think was it. I think it was the 18th. Actually, was the official anti SOPA day. That's right. It's. Uh, the 18th anti-SOPA and tons and tons of uh, mainstream websites were uh, were blacked out. So there was a lot of uh, mainstream users who had no idea what SOPA was who suddenly went to, you know, Wikipedia to check out something for, I don't know, a school or uh, a paper or something like that and were faced with uh, a big black graphic uh, explaining to them what uh, SOPA was. Um, what was some of the... Uh, the most interesting things you saw going on during the 18th? Uh, a couple things caught my eye, actually. The the first of which would be Flickr's response to the anti-SOPA movement. And kind of and caught me actually, off guard. Sorry to interrupt, but maybe we should actually explain first what the SOPA is, just in case somebody decided not to go to Google or Wikipedia or many of the sites that actually had it blacked out. Sure, sure. So if you happen to avoid the entire internet on January 18th, essentially SOPA is the Stop Online Piracy Act, and it has a sister bill called PIPA, which I believe is the Prevent Protect, IP... Uh, Protect Intellectual Property Act. There it is. Protect Intellectual Property Act. Protect IP Act. And so essentially both of these are bills currently working their way through the U.S. government that are aiming to stop copyright infringement uh, through various means. And really what a lot of the backlash is, is that this would give the government power over the Internet in terms of being able to shut down sites that they suspect are uh, in violation of copyright law. You know, it really... in in a lot of the online communities, they just see this as giving the government too much power over the internet, too much power over something that they want to remain free uh, at all costs. And so what a lot of these sites did in response is tried to show people what a world living with SOPA would be like. So what a world where if Google you know, had something on their server that violated a copyright could technically be taken down by, you know, the the SOPA Enforcement Committee. And so they put 
big black bars over logos and they blacked out text and they blacked out user profiles. And the idea was to really catch people's attention and say, you know, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but if something like this passes, entire sites and entire communities that you rely on on the internet could get shut down overnight for things that may or may not be within that site's control. And, and, and uh, you know, I think everybody is for, uh, I mean, this is kind of response for, um, for places like the, uh, the um, uh, music industry and the movie industry and others that have intellectual property that they feel is being pirated quite often. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the majority of the piracy is actually happening overseas. It's not happening in the U S right. Um, and, and so the reaction to this, uh, the way that it's, 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 it's kind of treating, uh, those of us here, obviously in the U S uh, where we're recording this from, um, it's, it's, uh, what do you want to say? A little heavy handed in that, um, in that, in, in that uh, approach. Um, and, uh, that people are are very afraid that the you know the power of the web is in its ability for folks to kind of in self expression creativity um all those types of things and and of course you know sometimes people overstep their bounds and they do end up using for instance a song uh in a video where they don't have the rights to do it and um maybe they use an image uh in a way that the the source um, you know, maybe a celebrity or somebody like that might not really care for. But overall, um, it's not like we have a nation of people that are infringing upon everybody's IP um, uh, here in the U.S. Um, and and so, at least in my opinion, it seems, and in, in many people's opinion, SOPA and PIPA um, are, are not necessarily addressing things in the best uh, of manners. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, as we saw with really this massive outpour of sites in protest of it. I think it's a heavy handed bill. It's, it's one that, you know, potentially has good intentions, but the execution of which was definitely not well thought out and left far too many loopholes for, uh, you know, abuse of power or potential misuse of, of the bill's results. Um, what were some of the most interesting, uh, you know, ways that you saw uh, some of the websites and, and people online protesting? Sure. So like I said, the I think my favorite or most interesting was Flickr's response. And the reason was they let users go through Flickr's site and you could actually click on an image and it would black out that image. And then if anybody else went to that image, they would they would see the blackout and it would post a message saying, you know, this image has been blacked out in response to SOPA. And this is kind of a, you know, a preview of the world or the internet, the way it would be under something like SOPA, where anyone could come to a site and say, you know, I feel like this infringes on my copyrighted material, or I feel like this infringes on my IP, and they could report that site and have either specific parts of the site or the entire site shut down. And so it was kind of a you know, you could play the government and you could shut down parts of Flickr that you wanted to. And I thought that was a really interesting way of letting users get a feel for both sides, letting users get a feel for, you know, a Flickr without content, but also the ability to just go around and say, oh, I don't like this photo and click on it and suddenly it's black. So I thought that was a very interesting response. The other response that really caught my eye was Pinterest. So Pinterest early on, I saw a couple of tweets and things where, Users are saying, oh, you know, I'm surprised Pinterest hasn't done anything to protest SOPA. It's really a site that would be potentially significantly affected because it houses content that users have submitted. They've linked from other sites. It's kind of reposting content. And so the the potential for it to be hosting copyrighted material is pretty high. And a couple hours after I started seeing these messages, uh, an anti-SOPA message popped up on the homepage of Pinterest. So it was as if they sort of showed up uh, in the morning and their engineers fired up their emails and realized, oh, crap, you know, maybe we should really uh, jump on board and support the cause here. So I thought it was interesting to see, you know, maybe they had that planned all along, but it seemed like uh, a very reactionary response where they were like, oh, you know, we, I guess we should kind of throw our hat in the ring here and and show our support for this anti-SOPA cause. 
Well, you know, uh, there were a few folks that I saw posting uh, online, um, actually probably just one or two that I saw that said, you know, well, uh, people around the world stood up and and uh, went out into the streets and that's how they protested. And, you know, what we're doing is blacking out websites and images and so on. And they were trying to being somewhat um, kind of. Uh, you know, diminishing the impact that some of these sites uh, would really have on what's going on just by simply blacking out images and uh, and logos and such. But um, I, I got to say that during that day, every every time I saw a news cycle from the second that I woke up and, and actually uh, saw the news early in the morning to uh, midday in the evening, they were repeating what was going on quite frequently. And so I think anybody who uh, didn't understand or hadn't heard of SOPA or PIPA were, were likely um, made aware, if not through visiting one of the sites that had been blacked out, at least uh, through the major media coverage uh, that was talking about it. Uh, so personally, I mean, I think that that uh, it really um, did its job in, in making people aware now. Uh, and of course, there was some shift in, in uh, some of the political uh, positions that people had uh, on on the bills in Congress. Uh, so I, I assume that that had to do with, with the protest and such. But um, it's very interesting to see um, all of the major sites um, and many of the people on many of the social networks individually all kind of, uh, you know, move in this unified direction to help influence the way that uh, this legislature legislature um, would uh, would decide on some of these bills that they felt would be affecting them. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you can even see this affecting people in something like Herderpedia, which was a Twitter account started by a user at QRush. And what he was doing is essentially reposting messages that other Twitter users had posted where they went to Wikipedia, saw that it was blacked out and didn't really understand it and were posting, you know, where's Wikipedia or why do they have to do this now? I've got homework due. And, you know, you'd, you've got to hope that somebody responded to that person and kind of explained to them, well, the reason Wikipedia is blacked out today is because of this SOPA cause. And, you know, here's what SOPA is and here's why you should potentially be against it. And, you know, I think kind of igniting that conversation was, I would say that was a successful end result of a lot of the anti-SOPA initiatives that were taken on by these websites. And it's hard to ignore when you go to google.com. Imagine how many millions of people go to google.com. And even though you could access the site itself, they had put a, a big black box over their logo. And, you know, that's going to raise at least a few eyebrows and have people say, you know, what, what are they doing here? I, I want to click here and learn a little more. So... And I think the the the, the numbers were like four point five million uh, had used Google's um, like a form or something that they had in order to sign a petition against uh, SOPA, um, and so that alone with Google was was you know pretty significant there. Um, but you know these these bills are not a hundred percent dead, and uh, anybody who would think about you know creating content to market uh, their brand or business or, uh, um, you know, allow, for instance, some of their customers or people in their communities to participate and engage with them creatively online. Um, you never know what way this could affect uh, could affect you in the future. And that's why it's important to kind of keep a keep abreast of it. Yeah, well said. So let's go on to um, some of the more advertising and marketing specific topics that we have here for the week. Uh, mind if I lead into the first one here? Sure thing. Uh, so Facebook this week, they announced uh, the ability for uh, brands and, and, um, and people and certain websites to uh, – Create applications that were accessing their new their their timeline. So the the timeline is uh, when you go to a profile, uh, your personal profile. You now have these timeline views that can show you everything from the first day that you signed up for Facebook, even if you decide to do so. Uh, the day that you were born, you can enter that information in there. Um, other milestones in your life, but it essentially is is kind of in a time based view uh, from today all the way you know, back through your life. Uh, and what happens is, it's, is previously Facebook was the only one that had access to really uh, making information uh, appear on that timeline. And they, in fact, actually opened it up to uh, Spotify, who is a, a music uh, application. So if you were to listen to music, for instance, you would see that that music uh, appear on the timeline. But 
for the, 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 fo the folks that are connected with you, when you go into your, your main homepage on Facebook, there is a, a ticker on the right hand side. So that's that, you know, fast moving ticker of information of all the actions that people have when somebody comments on something else or somebody likes something else or, uh, you know, somebody became a friend or whatever. And so over the last probably month, you're likely, you've likely seen the ticker and you've likely seen, for instance, if somebody's interacted with somebody else or potentially listened to a particular song on Spotify. Um, just this last week, they've now opened that up to, uh, I think, something like 60 something other websites uh, or and other services out there um, everything from um, Rotten Tomatoes the, you know website um, uh, primarily about uh, watching movies and ratings of movies and things like that uh, Pinterest which you talked about before things having to do with travel like TripAdvisor um, food food spotting and foodly so uh, uh, spotting food at a location or at a restaurant or something like that or even cooking a recipe uh, and they've essentially made it available for uh, all of those initial sites and services to create what they call verbs. Um, and uh, so, for instance, a verb previously, uh, or it, it is still currently, would be like, Adam liked the Solo Mo Show. So if I find the Solo Mo Show uh, page on Facebook or maybe even um, a link on the site um, or a button on there to like it and say, you know, Adam liked the Solo Mo Show. Uh, and so, for instance, previously with Spotify, it would be like Adam listened to the chicken dance, you know, <laughs> a, a, a song that was on Spotify that I that I listened to. Uh, and now they've they've uh, expanded on that again, where these partners that they initially launched with can create a verb related to something that is available on their website. So if we were to think of, uh, for instance, on Foodly, uh, Foodly is a, is a food, you know, where it's got recipes and so on, things that you can cook. And it could be Adam cooked and then actually say the dish and then could say on Foodly. Um, and so that's primarily going to come through on the ticker. That's going to be the, 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 the primary initial spot that you see it visible uh, to most folks, and then that information will also be kind of captured and placed on your on your timeline, um, kind of like a, as a keepsake uh, for uh, those who come and view your timeline, or for you, for instance, uh, when you go and you look at your timeline as well. Um, you have anything to to add to that, there, Corey? I think that's a pretty good summary. The a couple of notes that I would make is, you know, they've announced and. It's essentially responding to the fact that there's obviously going to be a ton of new content going into this ticker, but they've announced that while everything will appear in the ticker, not everything is going to flow through to the timeline. So Facebook is going to do their best to differentiate between major actions and kind of common actions. So again, using the Spotify example, every time I listen to a new song, it's going to post that into the news ticker but it's not going to post every single song I listen to into my timeline. What it's going to do is look for specific events. So if I create a new playlist or if I share a song with someone, it's going to take those larger actions and put those into the timeline. So there's going to be this you know, sorting period where Facebook is differentiating between important and less important events. And I, you know, I think it's self-reported initially where apps have to say, you know, these are the the two or three big things that happen on my site uh, when a user does these three actions, you know, pay attention to these, and then the rest of these actions, I want these to go into the news ticker, but you know, I don't necessarily need these to be recorded on a user's timeline. Um, so I think that's you know an important distinction to make note of because. Uh, even if you're creating a ton of content, it's not like it's all going to go into the user's timeline. It may just live and die inside of the news feed uh, and only get seen by that user's friends who are looking at that moment at their news feed. 
Yeah, I mean, most people are, are not necessarily going to go to your profile and check out your timeline. Um, I think most of the time what's going to happen is this is going to be uh, a, a, something that folks discover in the news ticker. So the news ticker is, is the most important spot for the most part for people to see that information. And in fact, they'll also, they'll also see it in the main feed if it's important, if it's something that should stand out. Um, just like, you know, now, now rather than showing every single piece of content that happens, happens in the main feed on the left hand side they're actually highlighting right the ones that you have said are most important whether that person is a friend or a family and you want to see every single update that they have uh, or whether you just kind of see what they believe to be the top news and and, and most important to you um, so that content kind of somewhat shows up on the left hand side in, in a in a in a different format right but the the news ticker itself is uh, I mean I don't know about you I I, I I would like to see some information that says how much interaction, for instance, Spotify and some of uh, the other uh, verbs that are uh, Facebook specific, what kind of interaction they've been getting, what kind of engagement they've been getting. I didn't think I would really care for that ticker too much. And I still think it's a bit busy, but I actually find myself kind of discovering interactions and discovering things that folks are doing, uh, even while I'm not necessarily focused on sitting there and watching that ticker. Right. Uh, and I actually, so I was aware that you were following me on Pinterest through the Facebook news ticker, ironically enough. So I was just kind of uh, staring off into the distance at my Facebook profile and was looking through a couple of things that were flashing by on the news ticker and it said, ah, Adam Helway is now following Corey O'Brien on Pinterest. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, that was actually one of the first Pinterest interactions that I saw in the news ticker. So a very timely update to flash by. And, and you know, what it all boils down to is that the, the dynamic for marketing on Facebook now has changed dramatically. Um, there is still content that could come into that main feed on the left but that content uh, is is now being weighed even more than it was before with Facebook's edge rank is what they called it. Um, so that's the algorithm that weighs how content is displayed on the left hand side, um, whether it's important or not to an individual. Uh, and so therefore, if you're not sitting there when it happens uh, that you might come back and find content that was posted an hour ago. But because of its level of importance to you, because of how much you've already interacted or engaged with that person or that brand that happens to be on Facebook and has a, a, a presence, a Facebook page, uh, then it will highlight that and it'll bring it to the top and it'll make it available to you when you log in the next time. Um, and so now with the, the news ticker, uh, they've taken something that is literally showing every single interaction that happens with people around you uh, and they're allowing you know everybody or not every I mean at the moment yes through developers but with these initial partners they were allowing them to expose these interactions that are happening on on their site um, in in real time and uh, it's almost like a quantity over quality thing yep. um, because you're seeing every single interaction and so although uh, having one or two people interact on Pinterest, for instance, may not necessarily get all the rest of their friends to interact on Pinterest. But if you have enough of your friends interacting on Pinterest, it may pique your your interest, right? Um, it may help content on your site be um, uh, gain some visibility on Facebook uh, because five or six or seven of my friends are using it and they're using it frequently, and I'm seeing that they've pinned this, you know, this, that, and the other. Uh, over the last 10 minutes and it it's streaming down that news ticker um, and uh, I like we you know like we said this is available also now to to developers and to brands that you know that obviously have access to developers or have developers in-house who can go ahead and create uh, a similar experience based on the type of content that they have and so um, you know my recommendation would be to take a look at uh, and we'll have it in the show notes uh, both a link to the blog post where uh, Facebook discusses this and introduces it. And then there's a, a page on Facebook site, uh, which I think we should link to that actually shows who all the initial launch partners are that you can go sign up and, and, uh, and activate this timeline and ticker uh, view of, of their interactions. Um, but you can take a look and see what kind of examples that, you know, what are they doing and how could your, 
um, brand take advantage of something like that in order to gain some visibility in the ticker. Yeah, definitely. And one thing, and I, I don't think they would ever admit this publicly, but it's almost as if Facebook is counting on the fact that there's going to be an abundance of updates and it's, it's initially going to overwhelm users. And I think what the result of that is going to be is that Facebook is creating just a, a drastic increase in the amount of content that can be sponsored by an advertiser. And so, you know, initially we've got these 60 applications, but potentially, you know, in the very near future, we could be looking at hundreds or even thousands of applications that are all going to be posting up to the minute and up to the second updates into these news tickers. And it's just going to start flowing by and you may see aggregate trends. You know, I may see a bunch of my friends just posted something to Pinterest. I should start checking Pinterest out. Um, But it really is going to be, you know, overwhelming to a lot of users But what Facebook is going to do is they're going to go to these companies and these application developers and say, look, for, you know, 30 cents an interaction or a a fixed price per interaction, we can actually sponsor that content and make sure that it's not just flowing down the page and out of a user's site. It's going to be in a sponsored content area. We're going to be able to promote that. We're going to be able to take these social interactions and really highlight them to a user's friend. Uh, the idea being, you know, I'm, I might see a bunch of Pinterest updates fly by and I, I may or may not click through, but uh, Pinterest as a site could then make an arrangement with Facebook to post, you know, it, a specific actions that are related to my friends. So like I said, you know, with you following me, they could potentially sponsor that and make sure that that appears on the sidebar of my Facebook page. Uh, for you know, 24 hours, and that way I'm almost guaranteed to to pay more attention to that than I would something that's just flowing down the news ticker. So the result of this is definitely going to be an increase in the amount of content that can be sponsored, an increase in the awareness of companies that hey, it's you know I really need to be sponsoring this content to make sure that I'm competitive amongst all these other applications that are posting to the to the news feed. So really, it's a very smart advertising play on Facebook's behalf and what smart marketers need to do is look at that and realize the opportunity that Facebook's giving them and how best to take advantage of that. Now, now what you're saying, just so I can clarify, uh, because currently they're not sponsoring news ticker. Uh, they're, they're not allowing folks to sponsor news ticker uh, actions and verbs, right? Um, and so what you're saying is because of the increased volume now uh, and the potential of having so many of these kind of verbs from each of these uh, brands uh, or, or websites, excuse me, feeding into that news ticker, each of those now becomes a potential uh, opportunity to uh, to pay for sponsor for them to be uh, appear as sponsored content on Facebook. Exactly. It's the same way as any action that was going into the news feed previously could be sponsored or I believe they call it boosted into the sponsored area. Now we're, you know, my guess would be that they're going to allow people to also sponsor content that's just flowing into the ticker and not necessarily into the news feed. And whether or not that becomes a, you know, a mini sponsored ticker or you can sponsor it and kind of bump it over into the to the news feed area is still to be seen, but you know, my I have to believe that Facebook is looking at this as a huge opportunity to boost their advertising revenue. And, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it just is something that advertisers need to be aware of and really, um, you know, look at best practices and look at how people are using the site, look at how people are interacting with the site and figure out where smart dollars are going to be spent on Facebook. Because at this point with, you know, more than 800 million users, it's it's the 900 pound gorilla that can't be ignored. So, yeah. And, and, um, and just to clarify for the listeners, you know, with sponsored content, uh, it, it really is just basically paying money to have content that would normally be displayed in the normal flow of wherever it would be placed on Facebook, uh, to, to actually pull that out and place it, uh, in front of, uh, users, uh, in a, on a more long term or permanent basis. So, uh, if if for instance, and I, I don't know how it would work with the ticker at the moment, but if uh, if 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 I went ahead and I 
followed Corey or maybe I pinned something that Corey had or maybe it was just an interaction that I had that has nothing to do with Corey other than the fact that Corey and I are friends on 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 Facebook uh, it could it, it would then take something that he might have normally seen in the flow of the ticker like Adam pinned uh, products I love in Pinterest and pulled it out and made it uh, a more kind of permanent uh, long-term um, piece of, of content off to the side on Facebook. So it was there for, you know, whether it be a number of hours or whether it be a number of days, uh, but it made it far more visible than if Corey had been kind of looking at the timeline and then glanced away. Um, and so that really is all sponsorship is doing. And they're doing that now with a few different actions that you can go ahead and, and, and pay for on the uh, sponsored ads uh, via the Facebook advertising, but I never thought about that. It's a really uh, interesting, uh, uh, interesting concept uh, that they could use. That as just you know, just flooding uh, Facebook with with a lot more uh, opportunities for for brands to sponsor um, content like that. So that's an interesting uh, perspective. Yeah, I also think we're going to see a battle a battle of sorts waged between companies as they try to come up with the most interesting and unique and eye-catching verbs. So um, I was reading a site that was talking about, you know, brands being able to sponsor verbs like lulled or, you know, uh, ewed. So if you can take, <laughs> <laughs> and, it, you know, it's hard to even say it, but apparently people are clicking these buttons. So Facebook's rules say that if you can take a specific action on a site, you can turn that into a news ticker item. So... It's these sort of, you know, celebrity gossip sites or these more pop culture sites. They actually have buttons like ew or lol. And so if you click that button, that button's exact text can then get copied over to Facebook. So, you know, you can't just invent words. I can't just have, you know, ewed on my New York Times post. But um, if the action is present in a third party site, they can then, you know, replicate that action on Facebook. So I think we're going to see sites start to add buttons and actions and things that are, you know, a little bit off the wall because it's going to catch people's eye when, you know, you, you see your friend ewed an article or lulled at something versus just, you know, listening to watched or read. Um, we're really going to see brands try to take ownership of these very specific verbs. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll share in the show notes uh, both the blog post again and uh, a link directly to the page that shows uh, developers uh, what are some of the current examples uh, with these initial partners uh, and how you can get started on your own, uh, putting in some verbs and getting some action there in the ticker. You want to go to number two, Corey? Sure. So... Number two was uh, coming out of the, I'd say, mid-size uh, presentation that Apple gave, announcing a number of initiatives. The you know the big one was obviously their new textbook initiative. So this is Apple getting into the e-textbook game, and they're doing so through the release of a new uh, iBooks authoring tool, and. Companies can use this iBooks authoring tool. Initially, it's designed, you know, exclusively to, or not exclusively, but it's intended to be used to design textbooks. So the the tool has kind of catered itself, and the way that you interact with it is catered to writing a longer form textbook. But you could see it potentially evolving into just becoming a, a general iBook authoring tool in the future. The and, other th and, and actually, and actually, they they've. Uh... Uh, they have marketed it and, and ma mentioned it as being a tool that anybody could use for any sort of book. Um, although the first release of the uh, interactive books that they've had to kind of set the tone and show an example of what can be done is uh, are the textbooks that they just recently released. Um, so, uh, yeah, from the start, they have mentioned that it could be for, for any, any form of book. Right. And I guess the, the last part of this was the iTunes U, which was an expansion of their iTunes University system, which is essentially kind of online or digital classes that you can take uh, through either your computer or your iPad. Uh, and they're turning the iPad into an education tool in hopes of 
both revolutionizing the education world, but also as a result, selling a ton of iPads. So, you know, it's not hard to imagine that their goal is to have an iPad in the hands of every child in uh, on their way from elementary all the way through college, uh, both using the device and also buying content through Apple. Uh, that would be a, a generous revenue stream for them, but also as a side benefit of hopefully being beneficial to students as well and making the school content you know, more engaging, easier to digest, more interesting. Um, what caught your eye on this story, Adam? What do you think were some of the big takeaways from Apple's announcement? Well, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, two sided. I mean, one one part related to um, to marketing, and one part not not. Uh, I'll touch on the the one that's not real quick. Um, it, it it just seems to be that over the last year, there's been a real shift in. Um, how technology and social media and the internet and so on is helping to revolutionize the way that uh, it's revolutionizing education. Um, and so for Apple to kind of step in like this, I mean, obviously it's a play on on selling more iPads and, uh, and kind of cornering that market and such. Uh, but, you know, the iTunes U, uh, for instance, uh, creating that that hub and some of the tools that they have, I mean, allowing people to, uh, teachers uh, and, and professors to put up their syllabuses and to um, assign uh, projects and do a lot of other things uh, via this hub um, is, is quite interesting and uh, allowing the average person like us, you know, who may not be taking the class to also have access to my knowledge. Uh, I think that that's what we're, we're able to do as well, similar to um, its previous form, which was in iTunes itself and, and how you could download, you know, lessons from different universities and stuff like that. Um, so that it, it's quite interesting to see how they're revolutionizing, um, education, uh, with that as well as the interactive books. Um, and, and now if we go to the marketing side, you know, those interactive books definitely, um, are pretty compelling when it comes to, to, to the being in a textbook format, uh, but previously uh, iBooks did not have, and, and the application iBooks directly on on the iPad um, did not have all the rich interactive capabilities that they currently do now um, because they they've upgraded the application, and so um, you know upgrading the application is one thing, but that free tool that they provided is is really pretty amazing because. Uh, they've made it free for one thing, uh, so anybody can download it. That unfortunately you have to have a Mac, which uh, I don't really mind because I'm a Mac person. So I've got a Mac and I can run it. But the tool is completely free. Uh, they've made it super easy to uh, author multimedia books with video and images and galleries and interactive areas of of, of the site of excuse me of the book, um, and uh, and then publish it. Um, so anybody who has er, content originally that they want to make more engaging uh, and more interactive um, can do so by simply downloading the application and running through some of the tools that they have and publishing something out there. Um, it's it's super uh, intuitive and uh, quite simple. Uh, now, there is a little bit of a point of contention with a few folks because – uh, in order to sell your content, you have to sell it through uh, the iBook store, uh, Apple's iBook store. And they're going to take the same cut as they do for uh, the apps, as they do for uh, other um, other content that they have available. And so it's going to cost you 30% of whatever you sell it. If you decide to give it out for free, you could give it out for free via the iBook store. You could have it downloadable on your, on your own website if you choose to do so. But the only way to sell is, uh, is supposed to be through the iBook store. And in fact, the user agreement that you have that says it right there, and a lot of people have been picking it apart, says that by using the software to author it, you have to sell it through the iBook store if you decide to charge a fee. Um, now, other folks are arguing whether or not that's you know good or bad or whatever, and a lot of folks are saying you know on the on the on the side of uh, kind of pro Apple side is look, they're giving you this tool, this amazing tool that normally would cost you five hundred to you know x amount of dollars up up um, uh, to buy and then to learn how to use and all this kind of stuff in order to author these interactive books. Um, 
but they're giving it away for free. So it's up to you to choose if you want to use it or not. Um, and, and so ultimately, you know, it's for folks to, to decide if you're an author again, and you have content that you want to, you want to put into an interactive form, check it out and see what you think. And, uh, and of course the content would have to go through the iBook store and then it would only be available on the iPad in that format. No, none of the interactive books are supported on any other platforms. So you couldn't go sell it on Amazon as an, an you know, an iBook format or in that interactive format, but you could go and create an EPUB version and, and sell it there. Uh, but if you can give it away for free, you could use this as a great way to create an interactive, uh, anything from an interactive brochure for your company to uh, I, I've been thinking about it for real estate agents to be able, you know, a lot of real estate agents put a lot of energy into creating these monthly magazines that show some of the homes that they have and have a few articles here and there and they're glossy and then they mail it out to folks. Uh, I wonder how much better the experience would be to send this type of um, content out to, uh, for instance, high end luxury uh, customers um, who probably have an iPad and actually showing videos of homes and having galleries of properties and having them interacting and actually talking on, on the book, uh, amongst other things. Um, so I think it's really compelling. I think it would be really interesting to see where Apple goes with this and, and if it takes off or not, and I think it will. And uh, really, if Apple kind of is doing with what they're doing, they're leading the way and therefore their competitors, who of course are people like Amazon and Google, are likely going to try to answer back in doing something similar. Uh, and so it kind of opens up the doors of innovation for other companies. And so those who want to author content win. Those who want to get um, great interactive material onto ebook platforms are the ones that win. And that includes, again, uh, not only authors, but people who just simply want to create engaging pieces of content that they can get out to folks to to market their brand, for instance. Sure. And I think, you know, this is kind of an evolution of the content as marketing world. So a couple of years back, the go-to platform was creating your own blog. And that was really how companies and organizations got their voice out is they would create a blog and they would generate, you know, really engaging content and put that out there into the world and hopefully attract an audience. But now really the the blog world is, you know, I don't want to say saturated, but it's definitely a much more competitive landscape than it used to be. And it's much, much harder and takes a lot more effort to actually break through and build an audience online. Uh, and so what this new platform is allowing you to do is, is kind of start uh, start fresh. And so the, you know, there's really a level playing field here and anybody that can create content and can create this kind of engaging content, you're having to put a little more work into it because you're rather than writing a single blog post, you're aggregating a lot of that knowledge into more of a book format. But if you can do that, you know, you can really reach a whole new audience and you're providing value to users that's going to make them pay attention to your company, you know, check back for more. You're you're kind of creating a longer term relationship when you can provide somebody with uh, you know, essentially a, a free or a low priced ebook that's just filled with knowledge. So a couple, you know, I was trying to to picture who this would work well for and a couple examples I have were let's say you're a photography expert or you're a photography studio. You know, you could create a a a beginning photography textbook and it could go through things like lens choice and how to manage focus and you know what are all these buttons on my new camera mean and uh, by doing so you're educating people about photography and you're getting them more involved in it and so then if you actually have products to sell whether it's you know a class or maybe it's a new accessory or maybe it's an iPhone app you've built this audience that's come to trust the fact that, you know, this person really knows what they're talking about. They, they wrote this entire textbook and I feel like I've learned a lot from them about photography. So when it comes time to make a purchase decision, I'm much more likely to trust that person with, uh, you know, handing over a couple of dollars in exchange for the product that they've put out in the market because I, I trust the information that they've already created. Same goes for something like, let's say, uh, you know, a, a local bakery, you could take a couple of your really well-known recipes or maybe recipes that you don't sell publicly, but you've been dabbling with on the side, 
and you could repurpose those into a cookbook or, you know, an interactive kind of beginner's guide to cooking textbook and really provide people again with tools and knowledge that doesn't undercut the service that you're trying to sell, but proves that, you know, when it comes to the area of expertise that you have, you really know what you're talking about and you can make it fun and you can make it engaging and you can make it uh, educational in a very interesting way. Um, And, you know, I think that Apple was smart in taking advantage of the iPad platform. It's a very intimate platform. So, you know, you're, you're holding this content in your hands, you're flipping through it, you're able to view these big, beautiful pictures and potentially even video. And, you know, it's not just like picking up a, a paper flyer or something like that. You're really engaged by this experience and drawn into it uh and again you know really building a relationship with the person that created that content yeah and and you know just a few pointers for folks um you know things like uh you may not publish an entire book maybe you just have uh or or maybe you do publish an entire book and you have it and you want to sell it on the on on the ibook store but think about for instance maybe giving away the first chapter or two uh, for free on your site. And, and so that would give people a little bit of a taste for what you've got going on. Maybe even use it as a, as a teaser test, uh, by creating an, you know, a first chapter or two, making it available, seeing what the reaction is, and then develop it out into kind of, you know, a larger entity that could be then sold, uh, on the iBook store. Uh, you know, think about, uh, if you have content, and I said this before, if you have content already, and what I mean by content, do you have images? Do you have, uh, for instance, uh, keynote presentations or PowerPoint presentations that could be converted into keynote because uh, they use uh, they actually import keynote presentations and use them in interactive ways in the iBooks? Um, do you have, uh, and I may have said this already, photos and video? Uh, so I would really recommend taking a look at content you already have and trying to see how could you repurpose that by uh, by combining it with some some actual written text uh, that either you need to generate or maybe you also have and combining it into, it doesn't have to be a novel. It doesn't have to be hundreds and hundreds of pages long. It could be something kind of short and sweet and just getting it out there like, like you were saying, Corey, um, now it's been only days, right? It's been uh, tomorrow, I think will make a, a week that it, uh, it was announced. And so uh, get in there early and test it out and try it out and see, uh, what the reaction is. Um, and, and, and try to, um, kind of get a feel and an understanding of how you and your particular, uh, company or brand or business, uh, could use it to their advantage in the long run. I, I think it's going to, um, blossom into something you know much larger beyond the fact that other competitors out there are going to try to also allow for this you know interactive style of, of books um, but I think Apple will hopefully also try to make it available on other platforms maybe there will be an iBook reader for your desktop although I, I don't think that that's as compelling as having it directly on your on your your iPad um, but uh, at any rate I think it's something that people definitely need to uh, to check out, download the tool. Uh, we'll try to have a link to it if possible on our show notes and uh, play around with it a little bit. Yeah. So what do you say we move on to the next story here? Uh, sure. So I think the next thing we had queued up was a new commercial that the application Color put out recently. So Color was an app that debuted to, uh, you know, pretty large promises that I think they they struggled to live up to initially. And so what they've done is they've they've pivoted, as uh, I believe the, the popular term is, they've pivoted and gone after a new market. So what Color now is, is a front end for Facebook. So if you're adding photos or uploading video or really sharing uh, an experience that you're having, Color wants to be the application that you do that from. And so they put out this video and we'll include a link to it in the show notes. And I encourage everybody to go watch it so you can see what we're talking about here, but they put out this video uh, and it's really targeted at a younger demographic. So it's got a bunch of kids. uh, I'm assuming they're, they're in high school. They're either, you know, late middle school or into high school age kids. uh, And they're walking down the street and they kind of peek over this fence and they see that there's, 
this empty house with a pool in the backyard. So all the kids hop over the fence and suddenly it's, uh, you know, sort of this underground pool party and there's kids taking pictures and sharing video and it's all going up onto Facebook in real time. And their friends are on Facebook checking out these photos and checking out these videos. And, you know, it's really kind of this crazy, you'd, you'd almost imagine it as like an 80s, a scene out of a, an 80s uh, movie where there's, you know, just kids getting crazy and it, it kind of ends on these two kids making out in the pool and it's supposed to be this, you know, very provocative and, and risque thing. And um, it caught the eye of a lot of bloggers because they felt that, you know, this commercial was portraying this world that doesn't actually exist. There was a lot of feedback saying, you know, I don't think I've ever heard of kids breaking into somebody's backyard and throwing an impromptu pool party and you know, what kind of crap is this? This doesn't, uh, this doesn't seem like a legitimate commercial. And, you know, is this real? Is this like a, you know, are you actually trying to say that users would do something like this and then share it all via Facebook? Is this the world that we live in now? Um, and regardless of the value of the app itself, what I thought was interesting was the response to the ad and the fact that, you know, we sort of put this off as being a very unrealistic scenario, but it made me wonder, you know, the the youth market is a very tricky market and it's something that a lot of marketers and advertisers struggle to understand and struggle to get a grasp on. And, you know, it made me kind of second guess my own initial reaction and say, maybe this isn't as far-fetched as it seems. And, you know, sure, it might be a little aspirational. I highly doubt all these kids are breaking into people's backyards every day to throw throw these pool parties, but maybe the idea that, you know, kids kind of live vicariously through their cell phones and through social networks now, uh, and they're broadcasting these actions that, you know, as as adults and as parents, uh, you might not like the actions, but kids are still doing them and they're still sharing them and it's still going into this online world and that's becoming more acceptable. Uh, and I thought that was, you know, potentially a really interesting insight into this youth market. And, uh, you know, I think maybe it, it like I said, it wasn't as far fetched as a lot of us would believe. You know, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've got my own opinion on on color the app by itself. Um, uh, you know, sometimes people create advertisements simply for shock value, right? And that shock value uh, drives um, discussions about it and mentions about it on the web and 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 word of mouth um, and uh, and and. You know, when something is bad, it's it's it, it can get passed around as much as if it's good, yeah. right? Um, and and if if something has a message attached to it, like download this app or check out Color, um, even if the message is crap, like you said, um, ultimately it still may bring awareness to the app, and people may say, "Well, this ad was was crap, but the app is kind of cool." Uh, when it comes to Color, my opinion is, is the app is crap as well but um <laughs> it, it just the, the whole mechanics behind it and everything I, I just don't think they do a great job of it uh, and so in my mind it's it's uh you know and, and seeing the the advertisement shortly before we we jumped on on recording uh uh i, I don't know i think um i don't know if necessarily youth market is like you know is like that i don't know if that's if that's on message for the, for that type of uh, for that type of user, uh, like you said, you know, is it realistic that somebody uh, would would record and share proof on Facebook of them uh, stripping down to their underwear uh, and jumping into a pool and making out and you know whatever the, the case may be? Uh, I, I think it might just be um, trying to be risque for the sake of being risque and hopefully getting people to kind of share it. Yeah. Um, you know, f f just, just for the sake of that. Um, you know, I don't know. It's, it's interesting obviously to see the backlash or, you know, the backlash, I don't know. You tell me, was the backlash proportionate to like, you know, did it seem like a majority of folks really didn't, find it in, in good taste or really thought that it was off the mark or is it just kind of a few folks felt that way? Yeah. I don't know if backlash is this is the right word. I don't know that there were, you know, hundreds of blog posts and suddenly the internet was in an uproar, but I would say that the general consensus from the people that I saw that were talking about it was just that either, you know, a, it was an unrealistic ad or B it was just flat out a bad ad that 
didn't make them want to download color and start using it as part of their, you know, mobile Facebook workflow. Yeah. And I'm kind of wanting to check it out real quick and see how many views it has. So at the moment it says that, uh, it was uploaded on the 12th though. So it was, you know, it's been about a week, uh, and it has, uh, just under 18,000 views. Uh, and then there's of course the likes and the dislikes. So it's 18 likes and 142 dislikes. And I don't really put too much on the likes, dislikes, and even the, uh, the comments, uh, because people have a tendency, the, the ones that are more vocal are usually the ones that, uh, just want to troll on the, on the comments and, you know, say negative things for the sake of saying negative things. Right. Um, yeah, I, I would put a little bit more weight on things like, you know, the overall, um, proportion of positive and negative tweets and some of these blog posts and things like that. Um, but, uh, I don't know, I'd be interested to see what, what effect it's had on um, on the numbers of folks that have downloaded uh, the color app? Sure. Well, judging by the eighteen thousand views, I'd say not a huge impact, but uh, you know, it did start at least some conversation, and hey, it got us to cover it on this podcast. So I guess if uh, shock value for the sake of conversation was their goal, then uh, it worked in a couple of cases at least. Yeah. So you know, after listening to the podcast, folks, if you go and download that the color app. I welcome you to do so. <laughs> Tell me what you think about it. Uh, I'd be very, very interested to hear uh, how you feel. And we'll have, again, um, the video or at least a link to it in the, the show notes. Yeah. All right. So next up was uh, Tumblr releasing some interesting numbers. Uh, and they did so. It was part of the Digital Life Design Conference that happened in Munich. Uh, and what they came out with is that they're now reaching 120 million unique users per month. Uh, and, you know, obviously everybody kind of uh, jumped on that number and, and posted it around and just said, you know, look at the, look at the growth of Tumblr. It's, uh, it's reaching this huge audience. And um, the takeaway that I had from this is that while it's easy to, you know, really pay attention to the new hot networks and the upstarts and things like Pinterest and things like, you know, Quora and, and those types of networks. There are these networks that are, you know, just plugging away and building up this core audience. And, uh, you know, at this point, I think Tumblr with 120 million people is is going beyond these early adopters and they're definitely reaching into a mainstream audience. And, you know, you're seeing a lot of brands start to adopt the channel. You're seeing a lot of... Um, Britney Spears is using a Tumblr site. Uh, Britney Spears is responsible for probably uh, a good majority of those 120 million people. <laughs> um, you know, I've heard she's pretty active on there. So, you know, it's really not necessarily the, I would say, the sexiest site lately in terms of grabbing headlines and uh, being in the news all the time. But that that doesn't mean it's something that people should ignore. You know, I think they've done well with really building up a core product offering and uh, providing potential value to the smart marketer that uh, sees that channel, sees ways of, you know, making the most of it and really creating content that is catered to that audience and is designed for sharing, designed for uh, retumbles and designed for liking. And you, know, you could potentially build a really solid audience on Tumblr uh, by, by paying attention to, you know, not, not the big, uh, 800 million user Facebooks, but also not the, the sort of 10 million user upstarts like Instagram and Pinterest really focusing on these, uh, these mid scale networks that have done well to, to grow a sizable audience at this point. Yeah. You know, uh, I've, I've seen Tumblr being used an awful lot when folks have, um, an idea, something that might be um, kind of a topical meme, you know, something that would will uh, that that's happened recently in the news or um, and been kind of uh, uh, what do you want to say uh, connected to the pop culture of of what's going on right now, and they want to suddenly create a place to publish uh, a number of posts and ideas and things. And I'm trying to think of some of the uh, ones in particular, like I think you know um, the funniest autocorrect. You know, when people are text messaging each other on the iPhone and there's a, and it, and it uh, automatically corrects your grammar, your spelling and usually not usually, but sometimes messes up in in humorous fashion. 
um, and people are, are able to submit that to to sites. And I believe that's on a Tumblr website. Uh, and there's been a number of other sites um, that have that sort of uh, similar uh, theme of content um, that, that somebody just quickly turns around and makes. Something might happen where there's a gaffe with a p politician or, um, or something else that's happened in the news. I think, um, for instance, over here, uh, when they had the pepper spray incident at the Occupy Davis, uh, I think somebody took uh, created a Tumblr uh, specifically to show a bunch of you know humorous uh, pieces of of art graphics that people have made using the the pepper spray guy in the artwork. And so there's there's been a lot of that. It seems to be used to kind of quickly create hubs uh, for collections of content. Um, and, uh, and then of course it's, it's, um, it's somewhat turnkey in its ability to create a, a fairly, um, I don't want to say viral, but, but, a, but a fairly social hub for you to publish content. It's almost not, it's not almost a blog, but not quite a blog in some, uh, to some extent. Um, and, uh, there's kind of this integrated community that happens because you're not creating a, a Tumblr instance on your own server where it's isolated from being connected to everybody in in some fashion um the community is really uh is pretty passionate on tumblr would, yeah. would you say so yeah and you know a couple other stats that they posted which kind of support that is first off they've announced that they now power nearly 42 million sites so 42 million people and it's not Obviously, each site doesn't represent an individual user, but you've got to imagine that multiple tens of millions of users have actually gone on to Tumblr and created their own Tumble blog. Uh, so that just goes to show, you know, the ease of which it is to go on to Tumblr, have an idea, and have a blog up and running in really just a matter of minutes. Uh, and the second piece, or the second number that they announced was that they have now been responsible for the creation of more than 16 billion posts and that's billion with a b uh so you know looking at 42 million blogs creating 16 billion posts there's obviously a pretty large post to blog ratio which means that these aren't just 42 million blogs that are kind of sitting there and not getting actively updated tumblr users are creating a, a ton of content and it's really this viral community where you know like you said, interesting memes and, and topical information gets shared very quickly. And uh, it's a very rapid network where, you know, ideas will live and die over the course of 24 hours. So it is something that you have to pay attention to and sort of get yourself involved with it and get familiar with what works and what doesn't on Tumblr and how the Tumblr community uh, reacts to content. But if you're willing to put in that time to learn the channel, there's huge benefits to be had from creating content that'll work well on the site uh, and reaching, you know, your portion of this 120 million users that they're seeing each month. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I think the, the, the moral of the story kind of with Tumblr and those numbers really is, is that it, it is kind of the, uh, the social network or, or the, you know, the social site out there that uh, it's, it's one of a few that the mainstream doesn't talk about often. Uh, and it's a place to kind of, you know, definitely pay attention to. Yep. So another number related story, uh, nice segue there. <laughs> uh, but another <laughs> number related story is Porsche, which recently received its 2 millionth Facebook follower. Uh, and, you know, pretty substantial number there's there are brands out there that have you know in the tens of millions of facebook fans at this point but for porsche it's still a, a pretty significant milestone and so what they did to celebrate is they created a porsche cayman and they covered it with the names of all two million of their facebook fans so you know they they figured out a program to essentially you know create a dump of all these usernames uh, they put that into a program and they created a, I believe it was a vinyl wrap that they used to wrap this Porsche Cayman. Uh, and it contained the username of every single one of their fans. And then what they're going to do with the car is actually display it in the Porsche Museum during the month of January. So uh, if you happen to be in the area of the Porsche Museum, you can go, you can see this car in person. 
But if you are, you know, one of the uh, one of the millions of Porsche fans that can't go to the Porsche Museum to see this in person, they've actually created a digital version online, and you can use this digital version to find your own name on the car. So they've created this really neat kind of interactive experience where you type your name in and it rotates the car and then zooms in on uh, on your profile picture and you know says hey thanks for being one of our two million fans uh, and then you can turn that image into you know a wallpaper for your computer they allow you to kind of repurpose your own little segment of the car and I thought what was interesting with this is the idea that brands can celebrate these milestones and celebrate with their users so you know, in the old days, you might uh, pop a bottle of champagne and celebrate, you know, the millionth visitor to your site. With social media, it's fun to actually get your fans involved and say, hey, let's all, you know, let's all get excited about the fact that our own community uh, on the site on Facebook is now 2 million strong. There's now 2 million of you that like Porsche or own a car or, you know, aspire to one day own a car. Um and it's cool that there's two million of us because that means you know we share this common passion and we share this uh, this common support for this cause, and so you know the idea that they've actually gone to the lengths of wrapping this car and putting the car in the in their actual museum and then creating a digital version of the car, all with the goal of really highlighting and celebrating this milestone, I thought was interesting and you know, potentially something that other brands should look at, uh, look at doing as well. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that everybody goes out and buys a Porsche and puts the profile pictures of their fans on it. But, you know, don't ignore the fact that, you know, users see these milestones too, and they get kind of excited when you cross the 100,000 follower mark, or you cross the million follower mark. And, you know, it can be fun. And it's, it is acceptable to celebrate those with your fans and, you know, kind of cheer on these these milestone crossings yeah um i I don't have much more to add to it because you you got everything you know spot on uh as far as i'm concerned um it just uh um like you said taking a look at how to to not just celebrate some of these things internally these these internal victories you might have but also be able to share that with your uh with your community um and of course you know just by by having another number, you know, uh, 100,000, 150,000, 100, you know, 75,000, whatever the number may be that you're trying to reach, it's not all about numbers all the time, but it's still, um, it, it may just simply be an excuse to celebrate, right? And so sometimes that's a good, uh, t- good, good reason to rally some of your users and your community around something, get them excited and and make them a part of uh, of something that you're, you're doing. And in this case, um, I think it's really creative what, uh, Porsche has done and, uh, you can check the, the, the car and take a look at it in 360 degrees, uh, on the, on the link that we'll provide in the show notes. Yep. All right. Uh, I believe that leaves us with just one more topic for the day. We got the final topic. Um, do you want to introduce this one? Sure. Uh, You know, I think it was last week we were discussing the new change uh, that Google um, had introduced on their search. So um, they called it, uh, I think it was Google Search uh, Plus Your World. And what they were doing was integrating Google Plus uh, very heavily, actually, into their search results. So in the past, uh, we had, um, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook also had some of their social information uh, visible and available in search results. Uh, and uh, a while back ago, those were removed from Google. It was something about you know renewing a contract with with Twitter, for instance. Um, and so they removed that data. And uh, since then, in order to make their search results uh, quote unquote social, they've just heavily interjected uh, things. Uh, information and content from Google Plus directly into those results. Uh, And so uh, if you might look for, like, for instance, the funny thing I've been seeing is if you search for Mark Zuckerberg, if you want to learn about Mark Zuckerberg, you know, you would think that the first thing that would pop up would be the most, you know, recently uh, updated profile of his, which is actually his Facebook profile. But no, what what ends up coming up first, actually, uh, is his Google Plus 
profile, which he hasn't updated for many, many months. Um, and obviously, Mark Zuckerberg is is far less connected to his Google Plus profile than he is to Facebook, which he's the CEO of. Right. Um, and so at any rate, there, there's there been a lot of people discussing whether this is beneficial uh, to users to kind of almost be monopolizing um, such an important spot on the web, you know, Google search with Google Plus results uh, from the Google Plus social network. And so, uh, interestingly enough, I think it was over the weekend, Facebook, folks from Facebook, Twitter, and MySpace uh, actually kind of worked together. And I think it was primarily driven by some Facebook developers, <clears throat> excuse me, who created a, a uh, website called focusontheuser.org. Uh, and what they did was uh, they they explain a little bit about um, what they kind of their position on on what was going on with the Google Plus um, search uh, search plus your world um, feature that was you know recently added there. And uh, what they've done is they've created a tool, uh, and I'm trying to remember what the name of the tool was uh it was something like the do no evil uh tool i think is what they were trying to call it um which is kind of funny because i think it's it's uh kind of poking fun fun at google who in the past said something about their motto or 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 something like that is is to do no evil uh you'll have to take a look at it um it, maybe you can clarify um clarify that Corey. but uh so they're kind of playing around with that uh, with that that phrase that uh, Google said a number of years ago, and they're creating this little bookmarklet, uh, which is a, a little uh, a little bookmark that goes into your browser, and whenever you're searching for something in Google, it will actually change the the Google plus your world results, which obviously are very, very heavily Google plus stuff like we we talked about, and changes them to what they should be based on Google's actual um, uh, algorithm without the Google plus content in it. So if you are searching for something, you'll see, for instance, uh, it's showing an example on the page where it will show Hugh Jackman's Google plus profile and the Muppets and IMDB and all that kind of stuff. But if you were to look at that without Google plus, you might see Google plus results far lower on the page if they're relevant, but you'll actually see, uh, profile, <clears throat> excuse me, profiles for more active, uh, more active social profiles for each of these, uh, people or, or brands or entities that you search for. Like for instance, with Hugh Jackman, it was Twitter because he happens to be very, very active there. Um, uh, and, and so what they're trying to do is send a clear message to Google that, um, the approach that they are using uh, with this very heavy Google Plus um, influence on their search result is not um, is not for the best interest of their users, and that if you were to be looking out for the best interest of your users, you would show all of the relevant information, especially the the stuff that is 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 most uh, most fresh and recent and relevant in comparison to trying to shove all of the Google Plus information up to the top. Um, and, and, and kind of related to, I mean, definitely related to that is the fact that, you know, almost the message that Google's trying to send is, you know, the only way that you're going to be visible or the best way for you to be visible and to have your brand um, be visible is to make sure that you have a Google Plus profile. Um, and that is pretty much, I mean, that's, un, I, I don't know, I don't agree with that approach. What do you think, Corey? Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the keyword here, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, is relevance. So going back to the Mark Zuckerberg example, um, and actually tying it into something that we discussed previously, one of Mark's recent updates was actually an anti-SOPA message that he posted to Facebook. And that message was liked more than 250,000 times, and it was shared by users tens of thousands of times. So it basically, you know, was was heavily broadcast through the social world, but that only occurred on Facebook. And so if you had only followed Mark Zuckerberg's Google Plus profile, which, as you mentioned, he, you know, essentially has set up to explore Google Plus, but then since, you know, abandoned and he might log in to view content, but he's not actively publishing content there. 
If you had only followed Mark Zuckerberg through Google+, Plus, you would have had no idea that he had come out against SOPA and made this very strong statement that was, you know, supported heavily by the, the online social community. Uh, and that reduces the relevance of these Google search results. And so, you know, I think what this focus on the user initiative is trying to do is to highlight the fact that, you know, the the relevance of Google is reduced with this and so with the inclusion of Facebook and Twitter and these other networks, you can bring back the relevance that Google has removed. Uh, in, in, the, in the long run, this is going to affect uh, – I mean this doesn't affect just users who are looking for information uh, you know, such as you and I. It also affects those, uh, uh, those of us who are marketing and advertising using the social web um, and, and definitely skews – um, uh, the uh, the visibility of somebody on Google in the favor of those who are active on Google Plus, right. uh, which is is just it's not a fair thing, especially considering all the other sources uh, of of information that are might, might be out there and, and profiles out there that are um, relevant and creating content on behalf of your brand, whether it be Twitter or Tumblr or you know Pinterest or your own website or blog. Um, they they should have a, a fair chance based on um, you know real relevant the rough relevancy and freshness and all the other things that uh, we've been doing um, as we paid attention to SEO for a number of of years here um, and to suddenly have that kind of almost wiped away and of course you can turn that off you can turn off the social search and so on on Google but um, in in most cases the average user is not going to be aware of that. Right. Um, and so they're not going to, um, to, you know, going to take advantage of it. And, and they may not even notice the difference in the results. They may wonder and, and get a bit frustrated why it seems that this uh, Google related content is, is what always seems to be showing up at the top of the page. And so um, I think in the, in the long run, this is still going to be, you know, evolving. Um, and just to kind of quickly talk about the reasoning behind this likely is the fact that, you know, Google obviously is primarily a search engine and is now very much a uh, uh, kind of bleeding into that ter territory of being a, a social network. I mean, it has a Google plus it's a social network. It's up, but it's still growing. Uh, and, and it, and it previously was keeping that separate from the Google search pages. And, and now those, the, what it's trying to do is have a social presence, um, and give itself an advantage with its most kind of powerful asset out there, which is uh, its search results. It's a place where everybody, you know, mainstream users, no matter how uh, social media savvy they are, not are are active. And the fact is, is that Facebook, uh, who's kind of in a way butting heads. I mean, they are butting heads with 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 uh, with Google. Uh, is actually got is actually owned. Twenty five percent of Facebook is owned by by Microsoft. And Microsoft obviously has Bing. And so there is a, a little bit of, uh, of this butting heads going on where Google is trying to gain an edge with its own asset. Uh, and, and Facebook is, is kind of working with these folks, kind of doing this response of focus on the user. And, and funny enough is that some people would argue in a lot of ways that Facebook also should be focusing on the user a little bit as well. Um, and, and so... At any rate, there's a lot of this stuff going on back and forth that has to do with these these two entities positioning themselves to try to um, you know get users to use them as resources for information as well as social networks and and so it's going to continue to play out over the next I'd say probably you know six months or so as uh, people get very vocal about what Google is doing um, and and I do definitely think that a few things should change uh, or it's going to make it very um, difficult for people to gain an edge on uh, on the search engine without having uh, a decent Google Plus presence. Yeah. And, you know, really, whether intentional or not, this is this focus on the user site and and bookmarklet is kind of Facebook and Twitter and these other social networks admitting that, you know, hey, we're we're threatened by this. And so we're going to take aggressive action to get the user on our side and get the user to kind of force Google's hand. So like you said, it will be interesting to see how this plays out. 
Um, anecdotally, I thought it was also interesting that they included a Google Plus button on the page. So in addition to being able to like it or tweet it, you can click uh, the Google Plus button and share it to your Google Plus network. So and you're talking on the on the actual website for FocusOnTheUser.org. Exactly on the Focus on the User website, you can share that using the Google Plus button. So you know even with this tool that's modifying Google, they're they're saying you know hey we understand Google Plus is you know, kind of now a legitimate social network, and a lot of people are using this to share their information. We just want to level the playing field a little bit and also have our information present. So it'll definitely be interesting to see if this forces Google's hand and if they make changes or if they, you know, stay stubborn on this and say, hey, we're we're going to make sure this Google Plus thing works and becomes a serious social network, whether you like it or not. And, you know, they're kind of betting on the fact that uh, people don't want to take the time to make the change or just, you know, are willing to put up with a little bit of hassle because they've gotten so used to using Google as their search tool. So it will definitely be interesting to see what happens in the coming weeks. And I think, you know, the fact that in our first three episodes, we've already had three Google Plus stories just goes to show the fact that, you know, this is obviously a very frequently evolving subject and something that I'm sure we'll be revisiting in the future as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, just, I just don't think brands should have a presence on Google Plus simply because uh, Google is forcing their hand with this this move. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, this, this focus on the user is an interesting site to check out because of how clearly it illustrates the difference between uh, when the results have the search plus your world in them versus the, the, the regular results based on relevancy. Uh, I, I don't think that the average mainstream user is, is obviously going to be aware of this, um, nor are they going to download and use the bookmarklet. So I primarily think it's for um, some of us that might be a little bit in the know, so to speak, on these subjects and some of the developers out there to take a look at um, and, and kind of to hopefully gain some awareness so that those who really are voicing their opinion uh, about this subject and have a, um, a voice that matters, uh, you know, about this uh, can can kind of get some some change and some balance to happen um, in in this kind of in this uh, overall situation. Yep, I agree. All right, so we went over this time, right? I mean, we were trying to keep it, uh, you know, between fifty minutes and sixty minutes here, and I think I don't know what your timer over there says, but I think we are about ten minutes over that, huh? Uh, I think we're even a little further. We might be approaching the eighty-minute mark here. So, Ouch. this is sort of a marathon episode, but a lot of interesting things to talk about. A lot of moving and shaking in the world of social, local, and mobile. So, hopefully, uh, people stuck with it, and uh, you know. As always, we want to send a huge thanks out to our audience. Uh, we're, you know, both Adam and I are are getting more familiar with this, and hopefully every episode is an improvement on the last. But you know, definitely appreciate the early audience uh, and the people that are sticking through these longer episodes and letting us, uh, you know, share our opinion and hopefully, uh, you know, bring some thought starting conversation into your world as well. Yeah, I mean, we we definitely uh, are working on it uh, over and over and over again, kind of uh, uh, polishing uh, eat, uh, as we go with each show. So uh, please make sure to connect with us and leave your feedback. And Cora, you want to share where they can connect with us on it? Yeah, as always, uh, being a social show, we have a variety of ways that you can connect with us. So the first would be via Twitter. The show itself, you can reach us via at Solomo Show. Or if you'd like to reach us directly, I'm at Corey O'Brien and Adam is at Secret Sushi. You can also search for Solomo Show on Google. Uh, you know, we've talked about it a number of times, so it would be uh, kind of wrong of us not to have a presence there. So we do have a Google Plus page and would be happy to connect with you there. Uh, and finally, if you have feedback that you want to give us a little more directly, we have an email address set up, which is solomoshow at gmail.com. And, you know, we love any questions or suggested topics or feedback or even just an email to say hi and let us know, hey, uh, you know, listen to the first three episodes and like what you got going and looking forward to hearing future episodes. We'd love to connect with the readers and uh, and get feedback and really just say hi and see who's out there. So, uh, hopefully connect with us through any of those uh, previously mentioned methods and 
we look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, and uh, by this time, hopefully, and if you're listening to this, it means you've probably heard us either directly on uh, the website, uh, the solomoshow.com, or you have taken a, a gander at the podcast uh, via iTunes. So uh, if you are listening to us on iTunes or even on our website, go to iTunes, go to uh, where you can rate the show, uh, you know, be honest, but be nice because we're we're working our way towards uh, better and better shows. We hope to have some interviews with some folks uh, on here that we think have some uh, good input to share. And uh, uh, you know, today kind of marks the first show uh, that from here on out we're likely going to be receiving a lot of feedback from folks because we're going to actually have our all the the first three episodes uh, published today. So this is kind of our official debut. And with that said. Uh, we hope that we can kind of refine things based on the feedback that we get. So uh, be kind to us on the ratings, but feel free to, you know, get on there and and help us get some visibility by rating us on iTunes. Yeah. Uh, Couldn't have said it better myself. So hopefully, uh, you know, easy to find and easy to rate. And we'd love to hear what you think of the show. And with that, uh, you know, I think a final thank you and we will see you next week. All right. Take care, Corey. All right, Adam.